Olympians were given five problems in the four hours of time. And problems ranged from very easy one to pretty hard a couple. So our hope was you will put away first couple of problems quickly and then we'll have an hour per remaining problem. We give the same problem to everyone who comes, which certainly is disadvantage for younger Olympians, but not disadvantage in the sense that older students know more. They certainly know more. They took more courses. They even know magic words like calculus, perhaps. But we don't base our problems on topics. And so knowledge is minimized as advantage. So advantage of uh, older Olympians is maturity, experience in mathematics, in life. So that's the advantage which we cannot eliminate. <coughs> we grade your solutions under code, ridiculously long code. So we don't know uh, whose paper we read. We don't know age or gender or school or school districts. We know absolutely nothing. And uh, that allows us to be objective. Every paper is graded totally independently by at least two judges. And if two judges disagree, they can convince each other. But usually, it goes to the third judge, the fourth judge, until disagreements are ironed out. So we don't cut corners. We want Olympians to feel that their performance was uh, graded very fairly. Because if we don't do it, they may get angry n not just at us. They may get angry at mathematics. And the field of mathematics would lose brilliant mathematicians of the future. So that's why we do our grading job very, very thoroughly. And all top papers, in addition to everyone else, I grade myself so that there is some uniformity at the top. <coughs> OK? So let's start. The problems were selected and edited for you by problem committee that consists of two people, uh, Colonel Dr. Ewell and I. And the problems this time were all created by me, especially for this Olympiad. Problem one, the knights of the square table. Knights of the round table you study in your history and literature classes, right? So here was table square. Can a knight placed on a 217 by 217 chessboard after a series of moves end up on a square sharing a side with a starting square? If yes, what is the minimum number of required moves? And question B, the same question, but I invented super knight. The super knight, unlike regular knight, goes three squares in a vertical or horizontal direction, and then one perpendicular to it. The regular knight goes two and one, super knight three and one. OK? <coughs> so as you can see, if we start at squared 0, we can move to square 1, th from there to square 2, from there to square 3. And so three moves suffice for regular night. Can we do better? Well, we can do it in one move, right? Because one move takes the night away from uh, neighboring the starting square. We cannot do it in two, because after two moves, uh, we don't get uh, a white square. We get a black square, and all neighbors of square zero are white. Therefore, three is minimum. Okay? 
If you have any questions, just ask. Don't wait till the end when you forget your question. Ask right away. Oh, I have to hold it longer. There. Let's switch equipment. Yeah. Okay. So let me make chessboard, which is pretty easy, right? I don't want to project everything because uh, Colonel Doctor will be upset with me for mechanical presentation of solutions, so I will do some by hand. Actually, it's all by mind. Hand only helps, you know. Okay, okay. So here is what happens with the super night. If, let's say, super knight is here, then we go one, two, three, and to the right. And what do we get? We went from white to white. If we go one, two, three, we get from white to white. So no matter what move you make with the super knight, it preserves the color of starting square, and because all neighbors of the starting square are red in my picture, uh, we will never get to the neighborhood. And so the answer with super knight cannot be done. Okay? Oh, yes, usually we talk about how many students Olympians solve the problem, and let's count together anywhere from full credit to most credit, you know, plus minus, three quarters of a credit. How many of 212 Olympians solved problem 1A, you think? Yes. How many? 212 participated. Problem 1A was solved by how many? By all. By 200. You are of such a high opinion about yourself. <laughs> and the good answer, good answer is 44. Which is quite low for problem number one. A. Now, how many do you think solved problem 1B? 10. Any other opinions? Huh? 50. That's pretty good guess because the answer is 57. There. Okay, and now let's go back to yes. I'll kill this music. Yeah, we already solved one B. And problem two, greedy coloring. Each unit square of 2017 by 2017 uh, square grid may be colored in one color. Find the minimum number of colors for coloring all squares of G in such a way that any two non-adjacent unit squares of the same color are separated by at least two squares horizontally, vertically, and diagonally. In the Olympiad room, we specified that um, adjacent 
squares are those that share at least one boundary point. So squares could be adjacent by a side or by a corner. But you see, when they're non-adjacent and separated by at least two squares, uh, that's all right. But if they are non-adjacent and separated but less than two, they may not be the same color, right? That's what it says. Let's try music. Okay, so once again, square grid. We had square grid quite a few times this time, right? In practically every problem. And yet they were all different, so it doesn't matter. Square grid or crooked grid, you know. So let's start by putting a color let's say here, that's color red. Then this square cannot be red, right? Because it's non-adjacent and it's not two, uh, two squares apart, so it has to be different color, right? And this square is not two squares away from red and from blue. Therefore, it has to be a third color. And this square is at a distance one in squares from red, blue, and green. So it has to be yet another color. And so we see that we need at least four colors, right? At least four colors. And so, doesn't advance? Oh, I have to. Due to technical difficulties, lecture has been canceled. <laughs> no? Okay, thank you. All right. You know, there are glitches even here, let alone in Washington, D.C. So here is four red squares that had to be colored all differently. So we need four colors, and here is four coloring. We, does it have a pointer? We have a two by two red square, and then two by two blue square, and two by two green, and two by two mustard. So we have four by four colored appropriately. And then by translating this four by four, we tile the whole grid with them, uh, with of course one by along the lower and right boundary, and here is Johnny. This coloring works. And so we proved first that four colors are needed, at least four, and now we show that four suffice and the problem is solved. And the question for you is how many of Olympians out of 212 solved problem two? You guess first because you were close last time. 20. 20. Any other opinions? Yes. 28. Huh? 28. 28. Oh, that's an odd number. I mean, even, but odd. <laughs> and the answer is 
Twenty. Twenty. And I'd say not for the difficulty of this problem. In this problem, I think the difficulty was in English cognition. You have to understand what is it uh, you are given. And so my advice to you in the future is understand the problem before you start solving it. And it sounds trivial, but you know what? In the very first book that I wrote and self-published, Mathematics is Problem Solving, and there are here to be given away 84 of them. Uh, first uh, problem that I gave there was, um, at the first bus stop, five passengers got in, on the second stop, seven got in, and three got out, on the third, 11 got in, and Five got out, you counted, you counted, and now the question, how old is the driver? <laughs> so, a lesson is don't start solving until you read and understand the whole problem. Of course, next problem in my math is problem solving book is the one that sounds just like this nonsense, but it has a meaning, and so I read it in the book. Divisions among us. Well, that's a topic of today, ever since November 8, I think. Each of 2017 straight lines divides a given unit square into two trapezoidal pieces whose areas are in the ratio 20 to 17. Denote by n the greatest number of the 2017 lines that share a point. So we drew 2017 lines, now we find which point is shared by the greatest number of lines. And the question is find the minimum of n over all possible sets of 2017 lines. So how low can you push n? So that's the question. Okay? It's a fairly easy problem for Olympians in those countries where geometry is taught well. <laughs> like Russia, France, Israel, uh, you know, those that I know. Uh, but in our land, uh, geometry is not taught very well. Geometry sounds often like, given legs of a right triangle, three and four, by using Pythagoras theorem, calculate hypotenuse. That's not geometry, it's exercise in arithmetic, right? At any rate, that's why we marked this problem as number three, me medium of difficulty out of five. And so let the line L split this unit square into two parts. We draw line B, perpendicular bisector, vertical bisector of the square, okay? Uh, it crosses line L in the point I, and through I, we draw a uh, horizontal line H. And you see that since original trapezoids, this trapezoid and this trapezoid, were in the ratio 20 to 17, we can take this square and add it to trapezoid, and this square removed. So we get two rectangles separated by line H, and the areas of these rectangles are in the ratio 20 to 17. Therefore, this point I is uniquely defined. On the line B, point I divides uh, that unit segment in the ratio 20 to 17. Okay? Now, instead of going from bottom to top, 
we can turn this picture by 90 degrees and do the same and get a new point I and another 90 degrees, a new point I and another 90 degrees. So there will be four points like this I, four points such that all our 2017 lines must go through one of them. Okay? So they must go through one of them, and 2017 actually is equal to four times 504 plus one. So to minimize number of lines that share a point, uh, we evenly distribute them, 504 each, and then one remains, so the answer is 505. Those of you who know pigeonhole principle can exercise that and see, because of this equality, the answer is 504 plus one. So, is that clear to everyone? Of course, I didn't have to straighten trapezoids into rectangles. I could have just used the formula of area of trapezoid, but you know, that is already ninth grade stuff. Formula for area of trapezoid. And I wanted my solution to be accessible to sixth graders who participated. You know, I can't make it accessible to first graders probably. But sixth graders, uh, I think that's the solution. And the question is how many Olympians solve this problem out of 212 attempts? Yes. 30. 30. Yes. 11. 11. Okay, and the answer is 21 which is about average of your two guesses. See, that's why I asked for two guesses. So that together you get closer to the truth. Okay. And now four color game. Two players in turn, color one unit edge, edge, not squares. One unit edge of 2017 by 2017 square grid and one of four available colors. The first player wins if he creates, or she, a circuit with no adjacent edges of the same color. Otherwise, the second player wins, find a strategy for one of the players, guaranteeing a win regardless of the moves the other player makes. A circuit is a continuous line along distinct edges of the grid that starts and ends at the same point. Something like, oh, what am I doing? I kind of pushed it too far. So it's like you go by this broken line along the edges of the grid, you know, and you come back to the same point. So that's what circuit is. We are allowed to use an edge only once, and we end where we started, okay? So, <clears throat> that's a nice problem, because in great majority of coloring problems, we color like cells, like we did in problem two, squ unit squares. And here we color edges, it's uh, different, different. And um, the winning strategy belongs to second player. And second player creates a template at home and comes to the game well prepared. There, second player comes with this template uh, that covers 
uh, all of the edges with L-shaped uh, tiles like that. You see L-shaped. That leaves uncovered uh, top edge, so we cover it by just segments, unit segments, and the right edge, we cover it with unit edges. The crux of this problem is to understand that in order for second player to win, come on, yeah, okay. For second player to win, uh, he has to prevent the first from making this, you know, uh, this circuit. But what is special about this circuit is that uh, it must have at least one turn like this. It must have at least one turn like this. It must have at least one turn like this and one turn like this. Just must. Because we're drawing a circuit on the, you know, on the square grid. So, oh, I'm too high. There. So there are four turns that we, as a second player, must forbid or make them both lines in the same color, like I showed red. But you know, there is a proverb, go hunting for two rabbits, you will get none. That's an old Russian proverb. And so if you try to chase four corners, you will get nowhere. Fortunately, you should realize that if you forbid just one of those four corners, then you win. Because in order to create a circuit, play, the first player must uh, use all four of this. Now you're trying to chase one rabbit, and one can be caught if you are quick. And so, I chose this one to forbid. Why? Because I can call it L shape. Others require some sort of names, but this one, you know, like capital L. That's the only reason. And so now the game is The strategy is pretty clear. As soon as first player colors uh, an edge, second player colors adjacent edge of the same L shape in the same color. But that's not all. In addition, what a first player is clever. It happens sometime. And he colors this, where there is no L. He just colors a bar on top or on the right. Well, second colors another bar on top or on the right. And since there are 2017 of these bars and 2017 of this. 2017 plus 2017, push buttons on your calculator, you will get an even number. That's all I care about. Even means every time player one colors uh, a line on top or on the right, second player has a move because there are even number of exceptions from L shapes. A good problem would be, and that's for your home enjoyment, what if original square grid were not 2017 by 2017, but 
2016 by 2017. Now everything is nice and dandy except uh, these exceptions on top and on the right, total odd number of segments. And so I intentionally didn't think myself how to solve this problem because I wanted to save it for you. You have a whole year before next Olympiad. What are you, what are you going to do? What am I going to do to keep you off the streets? Well, here is a problem. Stay at home, solve it. Send me your solution at asoifer at uccs.edu. Then you can go on the street. Okay? All right, that was number four. And number four was solved by, by, yes, no one. by no one. That's a lot. Yes. Twenty-five. Twenty-five. No one. Twenty-five. There was a hand somewhere here. Yes. Thirteen. Ah. Huh? Ten. Ten. And the last guess. Ah. Huh? Ten. Okay. Well, problem four was solved completely, completely, full credit, by UNO, by one Olympian. And two more Olympians got three quarters of a credit. So you can say three. But really, one solved completely, and two solved almost completely. What did they miss? They missed to say what to do if the first colors a bar on the boundary. And I think it's essential, don't you think? It's worth a quarter of a credit for this problem. Maybe a little more. Maybe a third. Maybe two-fifths, I don't know. But we deducted a quarter for not addressing boundary uh, play. But one person solved it perfectly. And so I'm waiting for your solutions. Not now. You know, go home, relax. 2016 by 2017, OK? And now problem number five. The game of Tetris. I'm sure some of you played it on your, uh, you know, handheld gadgets. Uh, you know, polyominoes are falling, and you're trying to pack as many of them as possible. It's not exactly what this problem is, but it has some Tetris flavor. A tromino is a figure made of three equal sized squares connected edge to edge. A tromino in the shape of an L is called L tromino. So a square, square, square. Okay? Question A. In the game of Tetris, L trominos fall on a 3 by 2017 square grid G, each covering completely three cells of G. Can all cells of G end up covered equally many times? And question B. Solve the same problem for a 5 by 2025 square grid. Well, experienced Olympians would immediately realize if we give them side by side question A and B, they better have a different answer. Or why bother? So one of them is a yes, one of them is a no. The question is only to guess which one a yes, which one a no, and then prove it. Because we give no credit for good answers, good answers. We just ignore them. We give credits for good ideas that are relevant to solutions. Even if you end up with the wrong answer. By the way, what a contradiction in terms. Wrong answer. It's either answer 
or it's not answer. A wrong answer, it's ridiculous. Or a wrong solution, which you can hear all the time, right? Wrong solution. No. If it's wrong, then it's not solution. Okay, so one is yes, one is no. Which one? Okay. There. We take 3 by 2017 and we put numbers in it like that. Uh, we color it in black and white and in black squares we put number 2. In white squares we put number minus 1. Okay? So, then when we put an L termino on the board, it could be like that, and the sum of numbers it covers will be zero, right? Two minus one minus one, zero. Or it could be minus three. So it's zero or minus three. Either way, non-positive, right? Non-positive. But if we add up all the numbers that we put in, we will get uh, 2 by 2000, 1009 squares with a 2, and 3 times 2017 minus 2 times 1009, which is 4 times 1009 minus 3 squares with minus 1. So when we add up all the numbers, we get 3. So the sum of all the numbers is positive. And each termino covers non-positive sum. Therefore, if we assume that each square of this grid is covered by n L terminos, no matter where and how L terminos cover three squares of G, the sum of numbers in L termino will be non-positive, right? Uh, non-positive because of this. See, each is 0 or minus 3, but uh, that implies that n times the sum is non-positive, which contradicts the fact that it's 3. And we're done. The answer is no. Observe, we have uh, lots of s s cells with numbers, 3 by 2017, that's over 6,000 numbers, and they add up just to barely positive value, 3. But that's enough to claim that uh, covering cannot be done because this is 0, this is negative, and by adding up zeros and negatives, we don't get plus 3. There are other ways to solve it. For example, one of contestants put one in all these top squares and minus one in the second row, and again plus ones in the bottom row. But then you have to use the same idea, but plus use parity. Parity, because uh, it doesn't give you instant result like this. <coughs> but first order of business is to solve, then to see which solution is better. And so, how many of Olympians solve problem 5A? Yes. Huh? 15. Can't hear you. Huh? 21. 21. Uh, that's blackjack. <laughs> yes. Two. Two. And the answer is, we got three perfect solutions and one three-quarter solution, so about four. So you were close. And so, so far, this problem is voted by your solutions as the second most difficult after problem four, right? 
where only one perfect solution and two three-quarter solutions. Here we have three perfect and one three-quarter. Now problem B. What you see is actually tiling of five by nine by L terminal. It tiles. As the president tells us every day, believe me, believe me, it's tileable. And if it's tileable, then America will be great again. So, but now you need to still observe that 2025 is divisible by nine. So the strip five by 2025 can be partitioned into blocks five by nine, and each of them can be tied like that. It's uh, not intuitive that five by nine is tileable, but here it is. And you see there is a kind of diagonal, one, two, three, four, you see diagonal of this l terminals, and the rest is easy to complete. Okay, and since it can be tiled in just one layer, then of course it can happen that every square will be covered by equally many l terminals, in this case by one, right? So, how many solved 5B? Yes. Huh? Seven. 20. One more. Yes. 30. And the good answer, good answer is 23. 23, so you are pretty good at tiling. You should get into roofing business where you tile the roofs, pretty much like that. Right? When you tile the roof, I imagine you have to minimize waste, and so that's what this does. Nothing sticks out, so we don't need to cut shingles, right? No, I think you certainly can go into roofing, but I would like to see you going into mathematics or computer science or physics or biophysics or business. We need bright minds in business, politics. You see, when I was little, my parents were telling me that uh, all those talented people must go into arts and sciences, and the rest can go into politics. That's wrong. I respectfully disagree with my late parents. I think we need smart people in politics. Otherwise, look what happens. So, any questions? That concludes the first lecture on how to solve it. Well, this is how. At 1,500 hours, we will have the great honor of our chancellor's address. And it will be followed by my lecture, Etudes on Mathematical Tiling and Coloring. Thank you. I have a great honor and distinct pleasure to introduce to you our Chancellor, uh, Professor Venkat Reddy. Good afternoon. Oh boy, you are tired, aren't you? There's a lot of brain damage with those math problems, is it? Let's try it again. Good afternoon. Okay, so you can get energized. Well, welcome to all of you and thank you for being here. It's also great to see the parents along with the students who want to study math. Um, in 1983, Dr. Alex Soifer created the Colorado Mathematical Olympiad and this is one of the best things that happened to our campus. 
in terms, terms of attracting all of you to come here and experience the mathematics competitions. Now we are in the 34th year. The Colorado Math Olympiad here at UCC is one of the largest essay-type math competition in the U.S. Um, it's kind of hard to think about essay and math together in one word, but that's pretty slick. Uh, so the Math Olympiad does not test knowledge. It challenges reasoning skills, the course of logic taken to resolve a problem with a workable answer, and to communicate that answer so others can understand it. Um, I always thought about this one because my background is my PhD is in finance. So when people say, so what, what do we need to do to kind of rule the world? I'm just kidding with you. But <laughs> always used to joke around saying you should have a mathematics undergraduate, English or communications masters, and a PhD in finance. You hear me, right? You math, you're able to think in the nth dimension. With the masters in communication English, you can translate that math, <laughs> right? And then you go into the financial world, which is all complex, right, in terms of the, uh, the way the models work. So the mathematics, uh, I have tremendous respect for that field as to what it, the possibilities are once you do math. And today's days, how many of you shop at Amazon? Anybody? Whoa. Is there anybody who doesn't shop at Amazon? <laughs> But look at how Amazon does things, if you think about it, right? They're taking massive data and trying to make sense out of that. So your future field, one of those future fields you should be thinking about is data analytics, right? I mean, how do you sort those numbers and make sense out of that? So the applications of mathematics are tremendous. So it's exciting to see that you're all interested in the math and your futures are very bright uh, in terms of what's to come. Uh, the suggested participation for Math Olympiad are students from sixth grade to senior year of high school. That's what I was told. But I also found out there are fourth graders who are taking this test, which is pretty impressive. That means we have hope in the future <laughs> as to what to come. Uh, I know you all love the challenge of creative math. I want to share with you a little example from uh, when I was doing my PhD. I went to Penn State doing my finance. Um, I know the parents would know it, maybe not the kids, about stock options, right? You heard about stock options? That's a multi-trillion dollar industry. So one of, a couple of these finance professors were trying to figure out, so they solved the whole, how to price that option. So what that is for the students, so if something is worth, say, X dollars, option is somebody else is selling that even by not owning it. So determining the price on that is pretty tricky. I won't go into the details. You need to come and take the finance degree to, right, Dr. Safer? You got to come to our business school. No, I'm just kidding with you. Um, but, <laughs> but when they were trying to figure it out, they couldn't. So then they ran into this math and physics professors. And they said, oh, we already have this in the physics, which is the Brownian motion, where the particles just bounce off in a box. And that was magical. So here are business professors physics professors figuring out, and they provide the solution for it. And the next thing we know, it became a multi-trillion dollar industry. So, the, so that reasoning and that intellectual curiosity uh, can open up doors uh, that have huge possibilities for us. Um, like I said in the beginning, you must be pretty exa exhausted, so I'm not gonna keep you waiting, because usually I would have stayed back to help Dr. Soifer give the awards away, um, but it so happens we also have Reicher Scholars uh, events going on today that I need to get to. So my apologies that I wouldn't be here to give, but I do want to congratulate all of you for participating in this Olympiad and keep spreading the good word. Weather is great today, so after this, I hope you walk around the campus and discover more things here. So congratulations to you all, and thank you all to you and your families. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Appreciate it. <clears throat> Telephone. <laughs> Not mine. I always forget to turn on my cell phone. I don't even know where it is. <laughs> and smart people say you need landline 
to find your cell phone. You call your cell phone, doesn't help me because it dies, and then I don't know where it is. <laughs> then it doesn't ring even when you call it. Oh well. But I am attached to email, to internet, that, that is mine. Every day. Okay. Etudes on mathematical tiling and coloring. Where's my toy? Oh, here it is. <clears throat> I assembled a few problems from Colorado Math Olympiad to illustrate uh, some things related to this year problems, but somewhat different. And then, if time permits, we will go to uh, somewhat more serious stuff, where not everything is solved. <coughs> Etude number one, bureaucratic institution. I love those, and so I created the problem in their honor. The floor plan of a bureaucratic institution has a form of eight by eight square grid depicting 64 offices, one bureaucrat per office. In the middle of each internal wall, there is a door. The exterior has just two doors, the entrance at the lower left corner and the exit at the upper right corner. Okay. In order to receive a certificate, that's the goal of visiting bureaucratic institution, you have to collect signatures of each bureaucrat. Bureaucrats have a notoriously short temper. If you show up in any office for the second time, you will be escorted out of the building without a certificate. And the question is, is there a way to obtain a certificate? So there. Here is bureaucratic institution, and the entrance is right here, and the exit is right there. And all of the offices look alike, right? Just, you know, square cells. Uh, but uh, it's up to us to make them not alike, like so. Now we have, uh, uh, you know, let's call it black and white offices. Now they're not all alike, some black, some white. Why did I do that? Well, first of all, I did it because it's my solution, which means I can do in it whatever I feel like. I can even play Beatles music as a part of solution. Uh, but more importantly, if you are in a black square, you can only get into white. This white, or this white, or this white, or this white. If you're in a white, you can only get into black. So as you walk through this bureaucratic institution, you will be walking black, white, black, white, black, white. There is no other way, right? <coughs> now assume that you can get a certificate out of bureaucratic institution, which means you visit every office exactly once, you enter here, you exit there, but if you visited every office once, there are 32 black offices, 32 white, you will be walking black, white, black, white. Since you visited them all, the last will be white because you started with black. But this last one ain't white. Therefore, you cannot get certificate out of bureaucratic institution, and that's what I try to prove to you. <laughs> okay? So here, coloring that is not part of the story of the problem actually solves mathematical problem. And a similar problem is about tiling truncated chessboard with dominoes. I credited it to Adam and Eve. Uh, that's what we mathematicians do when the problem is very old and we have no idea who created it first. We attribute it to Adam and Eve, you know. So, can a chessboard be 
uh, tiled. No, because once again, we color it in a chessboard fashion. Each domino covers one black and one white. So if tiling is possible, uh, equal number of black and white squares will be covered. But in, in this board, uh, we have uh, two less black squares than white because we cut them out in the corners. That's it. And now, etude number three, the tiling game that I created for Colorado Math Olympiad number six. It's just like asking you, where were you in April 1989? I know you were only at best projected to appear. But we already had the Olympiad, and here's the problem, Julia, Oops, Mark and Julia, it's missing Mark. Please insert. Mark and Julia are playing the following tiling game on 1988 by 1989 chessboard. They in turn are putting one by one square tiles on the board after each of them made exactly 100 moves and thus they cover 200 squares of the board. A winner is determined as follows. Julia wins if the tiling of the board can be completed with dominoes, otherwise Mark wins. Can you find a strategy for one of the players allowing him to win regardless of what the moves of the other player may be? You cannot? Let me give you a hint. Mark goes first. Why did I create this problem? For the purpose of fooling those of you who know that coloring can solve something like this. So I wanted you to color to realize that it doesn't do anything for you. So it's anti-method problem. They're important in education and I hope uh, you get some of it in school as well. So it's anti-coloring problem. And here is solution. Julia uh, prepares at home a template like this. How to tile the whole 1988 by 1989 board by dominoes. It's easy, right? Something like that. This is example for 8 by 13. And now, as soon as Mark puts a one by one square on the board, uh, Julia covers the board with a template and puts uh, her one by one to finish that domino that Mark started tiling. And so after 100 moves each, 100 dominoes will be covered and the rest of course can be tiled just like that. Okay. So that was anti-coloring problem. Stone Age Entertainment. Uh, through the years we had several problems about Fred Flintstone and Barney Rubble. Very famous people from uh, some animations, right, that I'm sure you're familiar with. Fred Flintstone and Barney Rubble in turn color unit squares of 2,000 by 2,000 square grid, one unit per move, one square per move. Fred uses red and Barney uses blue. Fred wins if he gets a red five unit square cross, you know, three by three. Uh, otherwise, Barney wins. Find a strategy that allows Fred or Barney to win regardless of how the other one may play. Fred goes first. So Fred wants a red cross, and Barney wants to disallow a red cross. So what should we do? Well, here, we tile our grid by dominoes. 
And as soon as Barney, who, who is first? Oh, Fred. As soon as Fred puts uh, a red square on a domino, Barney uses blue on that same domino. Why does that guarantee that Barney wins? I'll show you why. Oh, come on. Let there be light, said God. Okay. There. Okay. Well, look at this cross. No matter where you put this cross, it will cover one of the dominoes. It will cover one of the dominoes, right? Either this domino or this domino. And therefore, if Barney kills every domino, he automatically kills all the red crosses. Okay. So, and now etude number five. The same personages, Fred Flintstone and Barney Rubble in turn color unit squares of the same 2,000 by 2,000 square grid. And uh, Fred uses red, Barney uses blue, Fred wins if he gets a red two by two square instead of cross. Two by two square. Otherwise, Barney wins, find a strategy that allows Fred or Barney to win regardless of how the other moves. And Fred goes first, and this photograph is from the year 2000. Out of 460 Olympians, Scott Danford, who appears first from the left, a junior from Ponderosa High School in Parker, Colorado, was the only one to solve this problem, and he received Creativity Award in addition to his second prize. Uh, the one on the right is a gold medalist Manfred Georg from Fort Collins. Of course, it's Chichen. Manfred's father was professor of mathematics at Colorado State. That's Chichen. <laughs> but he didn't solve this problem, the winner. Second place, Scott solved. So what do we do? One thing is to realize that tiling by dominoes that we used wouldn't work. Because two by two square may not include complete domino. It may include pieces of dominoes that are sticking outside, right? So tiling doesn't work, that tiling. And this one does. If we just shift dominoes from row to row, Shift by one. That one works, believe it or not. That one is such that you put a square, put a square, let's say here, a square. It will include this domino. Put a square there, it will include this domino. So this zigzag, you know, tiling with a shift does the job. And the strategy is the same. Barney colors the second square in blue of the domino where Fred colored red to begin with, okay? So that was my intended solution. I came home from the Olympiad, looked at, you know, a very popular site called eBay and found this ancient Persian seal. A seal that dates to 4200 to 3400 BC. And what I saw on this seal was a solution of this problem. Here it is. 
a solution on a piece of equipment that is 6,000 years old. So, had to buy it. I don't remember where I put it. My two trips to Princeton for three years messed up everything. So it's somewhere. But fortunately, I had a photo, which I included in my Colorado Math Olympiad book, First 20 Years. So let us draw it. Here is what I took from this ancient Persian seal. That's a solution. If you color, uh, if you tile uh, the grid like that, then every two by two square will include complete domino. So the solution was 6,000 years older than the problem. So you should like archaeology. It can give you new ideas. OK? Etude number six. So close, far away. This problem, which I used in 13th Olympiad in 1996, uh, was created by Berzinj, um, a Lithuanian mathematician with whom I a couple of times served on USA, no, USSR, Russian National Math Olympiad jury. Uh, and I like this problem so much that I used it as the hardest, number five, one year. Some unit edges of an infinite swell grid are colored red. You see edges, like in problem four this year. So that one can travel along red edges from any vertex of the grid to any other vertex along red edges. So you can travel from any vertex to any vertex along red edges. But there are no red cycles, like that circuit in problem four. Prove that there are two neighboring vertices in the grid such that the shortest walk along red edges between them is greater than 1996 unit edges long. So two neighboring points with a hugely long travel along red edges from one to the other. Isn't that exciting problem? I just loved it. So here is solution. Observe that for any two vertices A and B of the grid, a path AB does not only exist, but is unique. For otherwise, the union of two distinct paths from A to B would contain a red cycle. See, if there are two different ways, then in their union there will be a cycle. So, travel from A to B for any A and B is unique. Now, pick two vertices A and B of the grid uh, such that uh, there are distance 2,000 unit edges apart. This is A and this is B, 2,000 edges apart in the sense of usual Euclidean distance, and connect them by the red path AB, which zigzags from A to B. So we connect them. You can see that is a path. OK? On this red path, there is a vertex O, uh, which is distance at least 1,000 away from A and from B. Here it is, right? At least 1,000, because this distance alone from A to B is 2,000 straight distance. And we're zigzagging, OK? Uh, let T denote a vertex on the red path AB that is adjacent to O. So this is T. 
we draw a circle C of radius 999 and center in O. You can see it on the picture. The vertices A and B uh, obviously lie outside of the circle, right? Because they are distance at least a thousand from O. And now let us color all vertices of the grid that lie outside of the circle C in two colors, black and white as follows. We color a point P white if a red path OP does not pass through the point T, and black if it does. So you see a path from O to a point P may go through T or may not go through T. And that determines coloring of points outside of the circle. Let us now connect the vertices A and B by a path along the lines of the grid that lies entirely outside of the circle C. You see it uh, right here. This new path does not have to be entirely red, unlike the path that goes from A to T to O to B. As we travel from the black vertex A to the white vertex B, we will definitely encounter at least one, maybe more, switch of colors. Let the switch happens from the black uh, from the black vertex A1 to the white vertex B1. So we go and here is a switch of color. This were black and this is white, okay? We can now easily prove that the red path from A1 to B1 is longer than 1996 unit edges. Indeed, we can assemble a red path from A1 to B1 by combining the red path A1 TO, A1 to TO, and uh, a red path fr from O to B1. Right? And this path is certainly over uh, 1996 unit edges long, and it's unique. There is no other path that goes from A1 to B1. So we found two points far away from each other if we travel only along red paths, okay? So that's a fabulous problem. I'd say harder than number four this time. Tiling three by three square, square grid by L Trominos. Oh, that's L Trominos. We just played Tetris with them, right? Is there a way to tile a three by three square grid by L Trominos without cutting the tiles? Huh? What do you think? What? No? Michael says no. There is no way to tile three by three square grid by L Trominos without cutting. And I'd say yes. Here is how. We can take a flat grid, make a cylinder out of it by gluing, and now we can glue a torus out of it. Here is tiling of three by three. One L termino, another L termino, and these three individual squares. And when you glue a torus out of it, they get together to form another L termino. So once again, the question was, is there a way to tile three by three square grid by L terminos without cutting? Yes, without cutting, with gluing. <laughs> I certainly would not give such a problem on the Olympiad because it's just, uh, you know, 
a little cheating, you know, a trick. <laughs> you're not allowed to cut, but nobody says that you're not allowed to glue. But for entertainment today, I think it's just right. And now a very long essay about bounded versus unbounded. We'll see how far we can go through this one. Is there a rectangle tileable by, say, tiles of shape T, if there is a rectangle tileable by shape T? Then so is the plane, right? Imagine you have a rectangle that is tileable. Of course, it implies that the whole plane can be tiled because plane can be tiled by translations of this rectangle. You just translate it and cover the whole plane, right? That's easy. Too easy for you. Is the converse of the statement true? In other words, the plane is tileable, the plane is tileable by tiles of shape T. Is it true that then there exists a rectangle tileable by tiles of shape T? So plane is tileable. Is it true about rectangle? No? Come on. You were so active in guessing how many solutions we got, and now you are just in such a great behavior that it becomes boring. Come on, wake up. Yes? No, because if you referred back to a, a part B of problem five from earlier, uh, the entire grid was tileable by Altronos. Yeah. And Hmm. So if the plane is small enough, then there's not another rectangle. But here, the plane is tiled. The question is, can you find a rectangle that is also tileable? What is given, the plane is tiled. And the answer is no. And here's Johnny. We can tile an infinite strip by z tetrominoes. You see this shape. We can tile it a strip, right? With these strips, we can tile the whole plane by translating the strip. But there is no rectangle that can be tiled uh, by this z shape. So the answer is no. It's nice when the answers are yes sometime, no sometime, you know. A cylinder is tiled by tiles of shape T, the cylinder. Is it true that then there exists an infinite strip tileable by tiles of shape T? So cylinder is tiled, is there a strip, a plain strip that is tileable? What do you think? Look, we can replay November 8th and just take a vote. Those who believe that the answer is yes, raise your hands. Okay, one, two, three, cold hands. Four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23. 23. Yes, and now no. Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty, twenty one. So 21 no's and 23 yeses. And therefore the answer is yes. <laughs> what? It's most democratic way to, de to determine the answer. 
More important things are decided in Washington, D.C. and Denver just like that. Yesterday, U.S. Congress decided like that to change Obama care to Trump doesn't care. <laughs> uh, so you see, just like that. Okay, but I can see on your faces, I cannot go to next problem, right? You demand more from mathematics than you demand from government. From mathematics, you want rigorous justification. <coughs> A cylinder is tiled by tiles of shape T. Okay, so now we look at the cylinder, it's tiled by copies of periominal tile T. I chose pretty complicated tile. We take a cut from the top of the cylinder to its bottom by a vertical line that does not lie on the edges of the grid. So here, we take a cut. Not along the lines of the grid. Then we take the union of the tiles that were cut. Union of uh, this tile, uh, this tile, this tile. You see tiles are marked by dots that we take. We take the union and their right edge here in bold. In this figure, this cut is indicated by dotted line, and uh, this uh, bold line we call step line. Now we cut the cylinder along this bold line S, okay? And then open it up and flatten on the surface. surface. As a result, we get a plane, plane figure F with parallel top and bottom boundaries and parallel left and right boundaries which look like this bold line. You see? And this figure is F, tile the strip. So it's hard to believe, but majority is right. Here is the, the proof of answer, yes. I lost something. <laughs> I lost music. Okay, so... Is that better? <laughs> Anything is better. So... The answer is yes, and you can see it's a beautiful problem, right? So we take a cylinder, we look for this bold line, and this bold line appears like that here. <laughs> Left edge and right edge is parallel to it. Parallel in the sense one can become the other by translation, by translation to the right. And so this is figure F, here is another figure F, here is another, and we get infinite strip. A really nice problem. And I like your vote, 23 to 21, close vote, because it's really barely possible, but possible. <coughs> now Branko Grunbaum, a great geometer, emeritus at the University of Washington, Seattle, and my dear friend, although we never met in person, but we exchanged thousands of emails and hundreds of phone calls, and he and I jointly created research journal Gembinatorics, which you can find online and subscribe. We have very special law rate for students. It's a journal dedicated to unsolved, open problems of combinatorial geometry. So Branko suggested this exercise. Is there a tiling of an infinite strip by copies of tile T that is not periodic? 
So we want to tile infinite strip by copies of the same tile, but not periodic. Periodic means the same pattern keeps repeating. Well, here we have a strip of ones and zeros, and uh, look how we create it. It's a one, zero, one, now two zeros, one, three zeros, one, four zeros, one, and so on, in both directions. And where we have one, we put this, uh, two by four, uh, and tile it by this uh, two uh, L uh, tetrominoes. And where it's zero, we put it the other way. And this is non-periodic tiling of the strip. Simply because uh, this fraction, if you look at it as uh, numbers, as fraction, is non-periodic. So that's what Branka Grunbaum contributed uh, to my book geometric etudes in combinatorial mathematics. <clears throat> One more, prove that every tiling of an infinite strip by co copies of polyominal tile T contains a bounded part that can be used to tile a cylinder. So from strip to cylinder. We already did from cylinder to strip now from strip to cylinder. And since we have limited time, I'll just will not ask you to resolve this question by democratic means. We already exercise democracy today. There. <laughs> Homework. That's number two. One was related to problem four, remember? That's number two. That will definitely keep you off the street. And now prove that every tiling of a torus induces uh, a periodic tiling of the plane. That's a tough one. From torus to the plane. Torus, you know, uh, most people call it donut. Some call it bagel. It depends upon your denomination. I guess. So that is a hard problem. I just will let you glance it. So we have a tile, uh, a tiling of, of a torus. This is torus that we opened on the plane. And so there are pieces. We assemble them together. They create this figure. You see here. Parts one, two, three, four from here. And that figure tiles the plane. But that's a hard one. I probably wouldn't give it as number five on the Olympiad because uh, this problem may cause increased blood pressure in laboratory rabbits. <laughs> but it's nice to know that you can go from torus to the plane. We don't know the answer to the following question contributed by Branko Grunbaum. The only consolation is that apparently no one does. No one knows. Isn't it great? You have a shot to be first. I really am against discrimination of young mathematicians like you based on your age. When you are told, no, you solve exercises, don't work on unsolved problems, it's too hard. No, I think you should work on unsolved problems only on those that you clearly understand, like this one, contributed by Branka Grunbaum. He's 85 years old, really a great man with six, seven hundred articles and dozen books. Well, now I think I matched him a number of books, but in articles I'm close to 400, still far away. Is it true 
that every tiling of the plane by copies of polyominal tile contains a bounded part that can be used to tile a torus. In other words, we looked how from torus to go to the plane, and now the question is, can we take tiling of the plane, a bounded part of it, and create tiling of a torus? 50 bucks for the first solution, and zero for the second. <laughs> and that's how it goes. You know, in Olympic uh, 100 meter dash, only one person gets a gold, right? It's Usain Bolt. <laughs> no one else gets a gold, so it's fair. That is the book that I mentioned that deals with this kind of stuff, geometric attitudes in combinatorial mathematics. <coughs> that is the book that covers all the problems of first 20 years of Colorado Mathematical Olympiad, but more importantly, it has 20, 20 essays that take off from a solved problem number four or five and go into further explorations, often ending with unsolved problems. And here is the book that was released one week ago as e-book, you know, virtual book, and uh, will appear in hard copies in uh, two weeks from today. That's Colorado Math Olympia, the third decade. Olympia 21 through 30. And further explorations means 10 more essays that go from solved problems to more sophisticated to open problems. And I picked subtitle to show our geography. It's from the mountains of Colorado to the peaks of mathematics. Thank you. Good afternoon again. Now we are ready for a real award presentation ceremony. What preceded were just mathematical games. And now the real thing. See, we have here uh, over 200 books uh, that are waiting for their owners and readers. We award them to you only under condition that you will actually read them. And we'll ask your parents to make sure and report back. Of course, if they're an American or non-American, then they will definitely report. If they're American, we have no right to use their services. Um, <clears throat> so this is 34th Olympiad, and probably 10th or so presence of Professor Christensen, about that. Uh, Tom was our wonderful dean of arts and sciences, and now he is an ordinary professor of physics. Uh, but in a couple of months, he will be extraordinary provost and executive vice chancellor for academic affairs of this campus. And he, Tom, through the years, has been a staunch supporter of this event, and I'm delighted to start with Tom addressing you. Well, thank you, Alex. It's always a pleasure to be here and associated in some way with the Math Olympiad. You know, as a physics professor, I do occasionally do a little math. Uh, so I, I have some appreciation there. But I do want to welcome you all on behalf of the faculty and students and staff here at the University of Colorado at Colorado Springs. We're delighted to have you on our campus and hope that we will see some of you on our campus in the future in various capacities. 
I wanted to share with you today, though, just something that the outgoing president of the American Mathematical Association said in a recent speech, and I, and I thought it was particularly relevant for this, this group. And that was, he was looking at, uh, at mathematics and says, the practice of mathematics cultivates virtues that help people flourish. There's a lot that happens when you're doing math. There's a lot of things to it. But it was interesting to me is what five virtues he picked out. He said that mathematics, the virtues that it's helping are play, beauty, truth, justice, and love. Now, if you think about it, at first I was surprised by the list. And then I got to thinking of how I, I played with mathematics. Certainly, you've had the opportunity to play with some wonderful problems as you were working these problems. I hope you were able to see the beauty of mathematics. I mean, there is something about the symmetries and the solutions and, and, and what goes into it that, that really is beautiful. And hopefully, as you were doing this, it's still cultivating within you some of the truth and justice and love. And if not, think about that tonight and, and go back and see where the mathematics and all of that is too. But anyway, welcome and enjoy. Five virtues. And the Beatles thought that the, uh, there is only one. All you need is love. <laughs> they also said, give me some money. <laughs> <laughs> OK. <clears throat> a couple of people couldn't be here, but they sent letters, so that let me read them on their behalf. They're not very long. Uh, you know, these people are too busy to write long letters. Greetings on behalf of the state of Colorado. It is my pleasure to congratulate all student participants and award winners in the 34th annual Colorado Mathematical Olympiad. Your participation in this competition is a testament to your hard work and academic achievement in mathematics. We are confident that your continued commitment to your studies will bring you bright and successful futures. Keep up the good work. You have my best wishes, both now and in the years to come. Sincerely, John W. Hickenlooper, Governor. <clears throat> Dear Olympians, on behalf of the citizens of Colorado Springs, I want to congratulate you on your participation in the 2017 Colorado Mathematical Olympiad. The Colorado Mathematical Olympiad is one of the most challenging competitions in the nation, and I commend you for your achievement. I appreciate the time, discipline, and effort it took you, your parents, teachers, and mentors to be ready to compete and I wish you the very best in all your future endeavors. Sincerely, John Southers, Mayor of Colorado Springs. <clears throat> and now I would like to uh, pass this lect lantern, lectern to Greg Hoffman, Director of Human Resources at Intermap Technologies and uh, uh, one of the longest standing sponsors of this Olympiad. Thanks, Alex, and congratulations on year 34. <laughs> um, you. you know, your, your commitment to this event is, is noteworthy, and I don't think it really needs a lot more explanation than that, but the, the heartbeat for what keeps this thing alive. So Dr. Sorper, we thank you for your, your service, your attitude, and your commitment. It's amazing. I, uh, I, I always feel special uh, because I'm 
the only industry representative. And the combination of education and technology is just a fascinating thing. I'm in the business of trying to attract and retain talent that gives us a competitive advantage in industry. We're, we're a high tech company. And the ability to creatively think about things, get outside the box, and challenge the status quo, um, it's hard to really uh, assess talent at certain levels until you really get a chance to embrace it. So for, for you guys to continue to you know, challenge yourself and um, bring yourself to these kinds of events and put your best foot forward, you know, I just wanted to say uh, you know, a special thanks for your effort and for your diligence. And we we'll just encourage you to keep pushing the boundaries. It's so important for us. And we think about creating competitive advantage so that we can be successful in business. It's such a, an interesting blend to see how these things come together. So thank you, and I, I congratulate you on your participation. Um, a special word out to the, the, the infrastructure that makes this possible, your judges, the teachers that are committed to this, the, uh, the tutors, and uh, the family support, those kinds of things. So hats off to you, and congratulations. Thank you for being here. Our next uh, speaker is uh, David Sotel, whom I've known for about as long as Olympiad existed. Uh, at that time, in 84, uh, he was a mathematics teacher at our premier Palmer High School, and then chair of the department there, and now all of mathematics coordinator for our largest school, District 11. And uh, he has always been very positive about this event. David. Well, thank you. And I bring you uh, greetings from Colorado Springs School District 11, the administration, the teachers, and some students here whose faces I recognize, who I've had the pleasure of working with recently on uh, actually some problems related to the Colorado Math Olympiad. I told Alex uh, when I met him out in the lobby coming in that this is my favorite day of the year, um, and it is in, in, in many respects. I'm reminded every time I'm here about what an extraordinary resource, what an extraordinary opportunity Alex has provided us in, in our community. Liter literally an international quality uh, competition an experience that you'd be hard pressed to find in most communities. And he's right, I, it's spanned my career since I started teaching back in 84. The other thing that I'm reminded of on this day is um, a piece that was written by a gentleman, mathematician, educator named Paul Lockhart. And he wrote a little piece called Mathematician's Lament. Do you know it? No. Lockhart wrote in Mathematician's Lament, imagine if we instructed music the way in which we typically instruct in mathematics. So think about school mathematics and learning out of a textbook and exercise after exercise after exercise. And imagine if that's the way we taught music, or any performance for that matter. Just exercises. All you got to do is play scales. You never got to put the notes together and really make a piece of art out of it. And your opportunity to come here and work on problems like what Dr. Seufer poses in the Colorado Math Olympiad is a cure to Lockhart's mathematics, mathematician's lament. It's an opportunity for you to get beyond the exercises and see what it actually is like to create mathematics, the art of mathematics. So for that, you should be deeply indebted to Dr. Seufer. And again, give him a great deal of thanks.
Our next speaker is uh, uh, Ruthie Manning Freeman, who is Assistant Director for Learning Services uh, for Talented and Gifted Programs at uh, Air Academy School District 20, uh, one of the districts that has been with us since 1986. Thank you. It's my pleasure to be here to send warm greetings from Academy District 20 and to see so many of our families, some of the children, the students who are here I have known since they were pre-kinders and watch them play chess, compete in science Olympiads and math Olympiads and be honored by our state uh, gifted and talented organization as leaders. It, so it, it's outstanding for me to be here with you and to be a part of this. I'm the cheerleader for all things cerebral. And there are many people who can cheer for sports events. That's not my gig. But I applaud you and I thank you for all that you are doing to support your children. I know teachers from our district are here in the audience and probably from our neighboring district. So thank you for your efforts. A funny thing happened on the day that uh, Dr. Field and Dr. Hatchell asked me to come and represent District 20. This magazine, Edge, which is an engineering magazine, arrived for my husband. And I always thumbed through it looking for those connections to education. And lo and behold, there was some, a connection. So in the article, titled The Outcomes of Cybersecurity Competitions and Implications for Underrepresented Student Populations. There were, the article linked student participation in contests and events to critical and creative successes and successes in the future as team members and excellent communicators. So everything that you are doing as part of this process will help our students in the future. And for this, I applaud you and I congratulate you. Thank you. After such addresses, I have to have a drink. <coughs> you know, <coughs> starting just in 2013, since it was 30 year anniversary Olympiad, I started in certain short addresses on points of profession, <coughs> professional ethics. Um, you are plenty bright to understand these issues. Um, I have to state that these are my opinions and don't represent necessarily opinions of this institution or the great state of Colorado. It's just uh, one person's views. And um, with that, I will give you uh, just a short portion <coughs> of uh, a view of a scholar, not necessarily a mathematician. Three points of view define the plane of vision. Where did I get that? Well, I just enhanced <coughs> a little bit Euclid's postulate uh, that says three non-collinear points define the plane. So <coughs> let's look at the points of view. Silence is golden, observes an old Russian proverb an old Italian proverb agrees, a closed mouth catches no flies. Indeed, talk exposes one's intellect. A silent person often passes for a smart one. Moreover, talk may offend, uh, prompt retaliation, etc. 
talk is dangerous. <clears throat> Assume you are willing to take your chances with the free speech. How do you obtain the freedom of speech? Just grant it to yourself. But beware, free speech may not be free after all. Be prepared to pay the price. For your views and your self-respect are worth it. <clears throat> Point of view number two, walking the talk. A popular wisdom defends inaction. What can I do alone? Isn't it ironic that millions of people hide behind this slogan? One can hide behind <clears throat> a fake defense like by doing nothing, one does nothing wrong. That advice is overrated. The great Albert Einstein said, the world is a dangerous place to live, not because of the people who are evil, but because of the people who don't do anything about it. <coughs> Point of view number three on patriotism. I cringe when I hear loud chants, USA, USA, at political rallies. Surely the loudest mouths are not necessarily the truest patriots. Nationalists, they are to be sure. <clears throat> In fact, on April 7th, 1775, the great British essayist Samuel Johnson objected to fake patriotism when he made his famous statement, patriotism is the last refuge of the scoundrel. In 1957, literature Nobel laureate Albert Camus, and one of my heroes, wrote, I love my country too much to be a nationalist. <clears throat> what is the difference between patriotism and nationalism? The famous Russian writer <clears throat> Boris Strugatsky <clears throat> addressed it in his 1995 uh, piece. He wrote, for God's sake, do not confuse nationalism with patriotism. Patriotism is a love of one's own people and nationalism is spite toward other people. The patriot knows perfectly well that there are no bad and good nations, there are only bad and good people. The nationalist always thinks in terms of ours versus strangers, ours versus not ours. He ascribes with these whole nations to scoundrels or to fools or to bandits. This is the most important sign of the fascist ideology, the division of people into ours and not ours." Unquote. What is fascism? It's a totalitarian regime based on nationalist ideology. That simple. <clears throat> and these three points of view define the plane of vision, not all quiet on the Western Front. Uh, these three points. When asked about his favorite book, candidate Trump replied, all quiet on the Western Front. You may know that's a novel by Erich Marie Remarque, the German writer. In fact, since his ascent to the presidency, uh, not all quiet on the Western Front. The Pope, Paul Francis, on February 18th last year said, a person who thinks only about building walls, wherever they may be, and not building bridges is not Christian, this is not the gospel. <clears throat> on January 26, 2017, CNN published a piece entitled, we are creeping closer to the apocalypse, according to a panel of scientists and scholars. The Chicago-based bulletin of atomic scientists has moved the doomsday clock, a symbolic countdown to the end of the world, uh, to two and a half minutes to midnight. It marks the first time since 1953, after hydrogen bomb tests 
in the US and uh, the Soviet Union that humanity has been this close to global disaster. <clears throat> American scientists worried about the climate change and President Trump's apparent indifference toward protecting environment and addressing climate change conducted a scientist march on Washington on April 22nd, 2017, the Earth Day. The satellite marches took place all over the US and numerous other countries, some 610 marches around the world. Take a look at the photos published by the New York Times alone. This is Denver, by the way, Denver, Colorado. And these are all kind of buttons. I hope that you, the future of America, and we mathematicians will contribute to making the world and America great again. Thank you. <clears throat> And now let's give out toys. My secretary and administrator of this event, Valerie Quirles, uh, uh, made this such a smooth and enjoyable event for you and comfortable to work for us, the judges, and so uh, it was a heavy job, and so we got for Valerie a very heavy toy. <laughs> a very heavy toy. <clears throat> Thank you very much. You. Careful, two hands, two okay. hands. Okay. I said, it's, <laughs> it's a heavy thing. Oh, here they are. Um, the judges were the ones who are guilty of giving you joy or tears <clears throat> you know, the judges. Uh, incidentally, I detest that part of my job, Mr. Provost. I would prefer team teach, you know, an officer, policeman, drag students into my class. Uh, the judge judges performance, gives grades, and I just teach. But we are a state institution. We can't afford judges and policemen, so I have to do it all. It's a tough job to be a judge, but we take it extremely seriously. And I can assure you that every paper was graded by at least two judges separately. And one of two judges had to be a senior judge, according to Colonel Dr. Yule, who initiated inequality among the judges, <clears throat> but for good reason. <clears throat> and uh, so all the papers were graded on average by three judges and top papers by more than that, and I personally graded all top papers myself for greater uniformity. We grade your papers under code, so we have no idea about papers author. We don't know gender, age, grade, city, county, and that's the way to do it. Because everyone has prejudices. Tom, imagine if I'm grading and have to decide who gets first prize, eighth grader or 12th grader. I would cheer for eighth grader. <laughs> <coughs> uh, 
for underdog, for the youngster. But then it would be fair for senior to tell in my face, look, this was my last chance to win first prize. And the eighth grader, he can come back four more times. <laughs> so everyone has prejudices. And no matter how noble they are, we eliminated them all in our grading system. And I want to thank the judges. And we have books for them. And please come to receive your book. Michael, yeah. which one? <laughs> that one, yeah. Congratulations, Dale. Oh, he just took four yeah. colors. You got another one? Yeah. Okay. Uh, stop by. Okay. Yeah, I don't understand. But uh, Ed, that is your computer book. Thank you. Thank I you. don't know how to read it. I have too many of your math books already. Uh, <laughs> Shane, I chose this Albert character for you, Einstein. I hope you like him. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> Colonel? Huh? Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> this is the program committee. You see it all. <laughs> committee with four ears and two noses. <laughs> Jerry. Thank you. <clears throat> all right. Ladies and gentlemen, would you give me a hand? Each of these people receives one of these. But here, uh, as you can see, there are somewhere there are two. Because there was no room, so there are two. What they get is these two books that I mm -hmm. donated. Mm -hmm total 200 of donated books, and this toy and certificate. Somebody can give certificates, and others can give uh, the stuff. Okay. I can have your hand of the certificates if you're reading names. Yeah. I will read the names, and they should be in this order. Okay. If somebody is not here, then maybe just put it underneath. Yeah. <coughs> OK. Let me get the least. <laughs> OK. For some reason, we had a tie for second honorable mention. 64-way tie. <laughs> See? Yeah. We have ties. This NBA now, basketball playoffs, they don't allow ties. They give overtime and overtime and overtime until somebody collapses and somebody else wins. You know? <laughs> OK. And so <clears throat> the winner of the second honorable mention this time receives uh, the book Mathematics as Problem Solving by Alexander Seufer, a book How Does One Cut? A Triangle by Seufer, <laughs> a toy by Wolfram uh, Research, that's the company that makes software Mathematica and also toys, and a certificate of the award. And the winners are Luke Schwab, Junior Highland Range High School, 
Anna Fisher, eighth grader, West Middle School. <laughs> Cassidy Donnells, sophomore, Dorothy High School. <laughs> Maggie Walters, senior, Pine Creek High School. <laughs> Dina Rosenstrauch, senior, Pine Creek High School. <laughs> Alexander Sasse, eighth grader, Vinograd, uh, Greeley Evans District 6. <laughs> Prabhor Paul, eighth grader, Mountain Ridge Middle School. Noah Kaske, sixth grader, West Middle School. <clears throat> Kevin Young, freshman, Fairview High School. <clears throat> Jack Davis, eighth grader, Windsor Charter Academy. <clears throat> Devon McClure, Seventh grader, Holmes Middle School. <laughs> Alex Mitchell, seventh grade, West Middle School. <laughs> Albert Lee, sixth grader, Challenger Middle School. <laughs> Alisa Watkins, sixth grader, West Middle School. Liam Adler Pollock, eighth grader, McAuliffe International Middle School. <laughs> Karen Coral Arona, junior, Atlas Preparatory School. <laughs> Quintum Williams, seventh grader, Challenger Middle School. Jeremiah Blackwood, sophomore, Vista Peak Preparatory School. <laughs> Chad Wireman, senior, Discovery Canyon Campus. <laughs> Abbas Shaikh, seventh grader, West Middle School. <laughs> Jack Brett, sophomore, Palmer High School. <laughs> Jack Haley, eighth grader, Aurora Quest. <laughs> Alan Wang, sixth grader, STEM School and Academy. <laughs> Nathan Amos, sophomore, Alabama School of Math and Science, Mobile, Alabama. <clears throat> Alabama kids have their own competition, and the winners are offered an option to choose as a prize where to travel to compete in another event. And so for the past 10, 12 years, they all chose Colorado Mathematical Olympiad, and we will ship their awards to them. I'm sorry? Oh, okay. You do give them these letters? Yes. yes. Yeah, okay. Yeah, they're all getting that letter. Mm -hmm. uh, may I have your attention, please? You're getting this letter. Uh, don't throw it away before reading, because that allows you a free download of great software, Mathematica, and that's a gift from Wolfram Research. So that's what this letter is. It's a great software. I wish I knew how to use it. <laughs> but then I'm a mathematician, you know. So where did we stop? David Wu is next. Huh? Who's that? David Wu is next. 
Алабама, right, right, Алабама. Where is Alabama? <laughs> Now I remember that it's Alabama. Where is Alabama? We've got David Blue as the next card that we've got ready, the next. There. There, yeah. Okay. David Wu, freshman, Rampart High School. <laughs> Andrew Mertz, eighth grader, Holmes Middle School. <laughs> Elijah Sawyer, junior, Atlas Preparatory School. <laughs> Max Shu, sixth grader, Rocky Heights Middle School. Varun Chil Chila, seventh grade, Fox Ridge Middle School. <coughs> Joseph Schulz, seventh grade, Fox Ridge Middle School. <coughs> Connor Percy, eighth grade, Mountain Ridge Middle School. <coughs> Page number one is done. Mia Cordova, Junior Valley High School. <laughs> Ryan Evans, Senior Liberty High School. <laughs> Ian McClellan, Seventh Grade West Middle School. <laughs> Zion Chai, Seventh Grade Challenger School. Joy Ma, freshman, Fairview High School. <laughs> Eliza Hill, eighth grade, West Middle School. <laughs> Nicole Hill, eighth grade, West Middle School. <laughs> Chloe Nguyen, eighth grade, Challenger Middle School. Ryan Liao, eighth grade, Ken Carroll Middle School. <laughs> Samuel Sarah, senior, Highlands Range High School. <laughs> Andrew Wong, seventh grade, STEM School and Academy. <laughs> Ari Wang, sixth grade, MRMS, must be middle school. <laughs> Cynthia Lin, sophomore, Fairview High School. <laughs> Lauren Shrek, eighth grade, Challenger Middle School. <laughs> Sonia Bartia, eighth grade, West Middle School. Samuel Lee, freshman, Rampart High School. <laughs> Austin Crawford, eighth grade, Holmes Middle School. <laughs> Quinn Ruddy, sophomore, Doherty High School. <laughs> Kyle Ma, freshman, Pine Creek High School. <laughs> Eric Forster, seventh grade, Challenger Middle School. <laughs> William Gear, eighth grade, West Middle School. <laughs> Roshan Kern, eighth grade, West Middle School. <laughs> Ali Stemper, senior, Alabama School of Math and Science. Gregory Thompson, seventh grade, Windsor Chapter Academy. <laughs> Caleb Cooper, sophomore, Vista Peak High School. <laughs> Kank Tu, junior, Plus X High School. <laughs> Pius X High School, sorry. Edward Lim, freshman, Fort Collins High School. 
Caleb Chang, sixth grade Challenger Middle School. Siddharth EU, freshman Cherry Creek High School. Atarva Vispute, eighth grade Mountain Ridge Middle School. Amber Lee, sophomore, Rock Canyon High School. Simon Lean, freshman, Liberty High School. Jack Younger, seventh grade, Colorado Academy. And that's all. And so, if you haven't won anything, uh, there are two options. You may win something higher or nothing at all. <laughs> and so we had a tie for first honorable mention. Where can I put this stuff? Here. These are your awards. Yes, thank you. <laughs> okay. With the um, first honorable mention, we have a tie, a 24 way tie. You know, it was 64 second honorable mentions, which is a good number. It's a two to the eighth or eight to the two. Uh, now it's 24, which is a great number. It's four factorial. It really is great. It's divisible by everything. 24 is divisible by one, by two, three, four, five, six, seven. No, not seven. <laughs> And so first honorable mention is accompanied by a beautiful certificate designed by Valerie Quirles. Very contemporary, very modern. I haven't seen certificates that modern before. <laughs> they will get three books. Mathematics is Problem Solving by <laughs> me. <laughs> How does one cut a triangle question mark by me? And uh, Colorado Mathematical Olympiad and Further Explorations. It's the book that covers first 10 years of this Olympiad. So that's what they get. Then that's by me too. Uh, Wolfram Paper Sculpture Kit. So, you know, Wolfram software download Mathematica. Don't mix it up, don't upload, only down. And the best part, I think. And the best part is this toy uh, by Wolfram. I thought, oh, yes, and uh, they also get a t-shirt of select few colors, select few sizes from medium, to extra large, and you know what? It's a one-to-one -one correspondence. So uh, choose one, and if you're the last to win that, you probably will have no choice, sorry. <laughs> we are not dealers or Fifth Sex Avenue, we're just Colorado Math Olympiad. But these t-shirts are nice, they're donated by Wolfram Research. Okay, now we have certificates, right? Mm -hmm. Tom, we have t-shirts, right? Mm -hmm. uh, Dave, Greg, there are books and toys. And the first honorable mention, by the way, did you notice in second honorable mention how many we had children? Grade six, grade seven, they can come half a dozen times back and achieve a lot. 
So it's great to start with second honorable mention. There is a place to grow. If you start with first prize, where will you grow? You're done. Right, Avi? <laughs> well, you can only go from first prize to second, right? But from second honorable mention, everything is up. And so first honorable mention goes to Agber Shaikh, eighth grader, West Middle School. <coughs> Grace Zhang, eighth grader, Challenge School, Middle School. <coughs> Vladimir Zhdanov, senior, Discovery Canyon campus. <coughs> Brian Bicar, junior, Dorothy High School. Matt Chen, sophomore, Rock Canyon High School. <laughs> Daniel Roa, freshman, Peak to Peak Charter School. <laughs> Nathan Jensen, seventh grade, Challenger Middle School. <laughs> Lavan. Vivekananda Sarma, <laughs> eighth grade, campus middle school. Ian Brobin, senior, Cheyenne Mountain High School. Carson Swoveland, freshman, Palmer Ridge High School. Titus. Sharman, sophomore, Karanada High School. <laughs> Andrew Jesuits, senior Discovery Canyon campus. <laughs> Sonia Chu, sophomore, Rock Canyon High School. <laughs> David Jordan, freshman, home school in Pudra. Luke Brobin, eighth grade, the Vanguard School, Shane Mountain District. <laughs> Aileen Ma, Junior, Niwot High School, San Vrain Valley School District. <laughs> Andrea Lynn, Junior, Fairview High School. <laughs> Luke Zhang, Junior, Rocky Canyon High School. <laughs> Gregory Lee, eighth grade, Spanish Fort Middle School. <laughs> Caleb Noel, Junior, Logos Online School. <laughs> Amy Wong, Senior, Pine Creek High School. Eleanor Grayson, seventh grade, West Middle School. <laughs> Raul Thomas, eighth grade, Campus Middle School. <laughs> and Anthony Wang, seventh grade, STEM School and Academy. The last named first honorable mention winners did really great. They came close to winning a prize. They didn't this time. They should come back. Are you going to come back? Good. Congratulations. Are you coming back? Good. See you in a year on 27th. By the way, here is a very simple algorithm to know when the Olympia it is. No, no, not when it snows. That's a wrong algorithm. The algorithm is Olympia is on the fourth Friday of April. That's it. Fourth Friday, you come to Valerie to register between eight and nine. You get entertainment to solve problems from nine to one. And then a week later, you come for this sweepstakes, and I can't predict 
whether a word presentation will be in April or in May. It all depends. But Olympiad is always in April on the fourth Friday, except when campus gets a lot of snow and police just prohibits us from entering parking lot. No, not because of people. It's because of cars. Cars need to be parked somewhere. That's why campus closes sometime. All right, well, we're almost done. Oh yeah, there are prices. Okay, Tom, this is Chancellor Scholarships for Olympiad Medalists. Okay. Um, now, these are the ones. I will present this and this. Um, third prize winners receive a toy. Uh, Wolfram download of software Mathematica. My latest book, not counting Olympiad book, it's the scholar. Oh, no, wait. I took the wrong one. These are bronze medals and this so this this is correct and this goes this gold this is gold which is gold this is gold right yeah, gold and we, look very similar. yeah but which are identical these two identical well there was a wrong book with this that's Gold, right? No, that's gold. This is bronze. Okay, okay, okay. Okay, so now we cleared it up. And so if you want uh, coverage for uh, your pre-existing condition, it, we believe in choice. You'll have a choice to buy or not to buy it for extra. Uh, but the third prize receives this book, The Scholar and the State, by someone, Soifer, that came out in 2015. It's a book about mathematician Van der Waarden and physicist Werner Heisenberg, Nobel Prize for 1932, at the age of 31, who then was scientific head of atomic bomb and reactor project of Mr. Hitler. So I tried not to include any mathematics in this book. It's about ethical issues in the Third Reich and today. And so they get this, they get a toy, they get graphene calculator, which is a great thing to have. You can use it also as a straight edge. And they get a bronze medal Olympic bronze medal of the Olympiad. Don't tell anyone that it's Olympic medal. People on Boulder Street may have a heart attack. And uh, they get $2,000 scholarship with strings attached. <laughs> it's a UCCS Chancellor Scholarship for those of you who enter UCCS as new freshmen. And you get then $2,000, 1000 in the fall semester and 1000 in the spring semester, okay? And you can, you don't have to be senior now. You can wait and then enroll, okay? So that's $2,000 for UCCS only. Well, the chancellor, you know, made sense. You know, the chancellor wants you here especially those of you who get these toys. And so, you know, when I was offered to have this 
scholarships. I only said thank you very much. And so we have a tie for third place for bronze medal. And it goes to Hanazang Junior Fairview High School from Boulder. Congratulations, Hannah. <laughs> By the way, when we're done, I'll stick around a little bit if you want some soifer to sign some books, you know. I will make myself gladly available. Okay, as I said, we have one more. Bronze medal, and it goes to Austin Mazenko, freshman at Cherry Creek High School. Congratulations. And what grade are you in? I'm a freshman. Freshman? Yeah. Wow. So I'll be back. Yeah, please do. <laughs> you see, Avi? There. Freshman, third prize, not too shabby. <laughs> OK, well, you know what? If you haven't received anything yet, you may receive Nothing at all, or something higher. We're almost running out of toys. But nevertheless, we have this certificate. We have this $2,000 for uh, Olympiad medalists enrolling at the University of Colorado at Colorado Springs. Then we have this $750 that can be used at any certified American university or four-year college at any at all, which is a great award for parents of the winner. <laughs> and uh, that can be used within two years from graduation from high school. OK, so that's flexible uh, scholarship. Uh, also, they get graphing calculator, the toy uh, the software from Wolfram, my 2009 book, which allowed me to say, my mother gave me birth to write this book. It's the mathematical coloring book, Mathematics of Coloring and the Colorful Life of Its Creators. Oh, just 18 years of work. And a silver medal not sold at Walmart near you. <laughs> and so, Now we hear the drum beat, the light goes down, the second prize, a solo prize, no ties, goes to uh, an Olympian who solved everything except taking care of boundary conditions in problem number four. So all full credits and only for problem number four, the judges awarded 75%, and hence $750. <laughs> and uh, this prestigious silver medal goes to a person who has seen gold the last two years. He won gold medal two years ago and one year ago, 
and his name is Honggi Cheng, junior at Fairview High School from Boulder. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> Avi, you know the drill. <laughs> oh well, we will ship the medal. With scholarships, we have very strict rules. Sorry about that, but uh, we want to enjoy seeing our winners. And so, if you haven't won anything yet, you will win nothing or just first prize. Just first prize, it comes with this beautiful certificate designed by Valerie Curls. It comes with $2,000 inflexible scholarship for University of Colorado, Colorado Springs only. It comes with $1,000 to be used at any university in the United States. It comes with Wolfram software, with Wolfram toy, with graphing calculator, with Seufer's book, the mathematical coloring book, and with the medal of color gold, and it goes to our first prize winner of two years ago, and second prize winner a year ago, and now not just first prize, but 100% paper. 100% papers don't happen every year, they happen seldom. But Avi Schwartz, Avi Schwartz solved it all. <laughs> I would ask uh, medal winners with gold and, and bronze to please come uh, next to the stage to take photograph for our website. Avi, congratulations, I'm very happy for you. This is fabulous result. Not just first prize, but rare 100% paper. It's wonderful, and I have to add, it was very well written with a touch of mathematical culture. Congratulations. So, as I said, medal winners, please come here for a picture. Everyone else, of course, is welcome to take pictures, to talk to me, I'm available. Uh, you are welcome to stay in touch. My email is asoifer at uccs.edu, okay? And if I don't hear from you before, I want to see you all on 27th of April, 2018, for 35th Colorado Mathematical Olympiad. Thank you very much. <laughs>